Hey everybody, welcome to Young Bucks. Today we've got a really great show for you. Most importantly, we're going to talk about our college football picks. All four of us are above 500 against the gambling spread so far, so stay tuned for those picks. We're also going to talk about mergers and acquisitions and the challenges tied there too, and give away some teasers about the new iPhone and what's expected there. Y'all have a great day. Hey everybody, uh, I'm Sam, this is Ben, welcome back. Uh, we are here to do a little educational talk on mergers and acquisitions. Um, so Ben's gonna lead it off and just what exactly is a merger and or acquisition? Well, merger is a funny term because mergers don't really exist in my opinion. I think that most things actually take the form of an acquisition. There's one management team that stays and one management team is gone. They can get board seats or whatever, but they're usually gone. So really just think about them as acquisitions. If you hear someone talk about a merger, usually that's because there's more of a stock-based component to it rather than cash because you can acquire something by paying stock for it or cash. Um, but usually an acquisition is done for a number of ways. The first is defensive. This is when you acquire a potential competitor or technology in order to keep pace with the next guy. So think of, in my opinion, Intel acquiring Mobileye. Intel was falling behind in kind of the new age. They were falling behind to NVIDIA in terms of the new processing units. And so they acquired Mobileye, which had a new exciting technology with which they could keep pace with the industry or which they think they could keep pace. An offensive acquisition in contrast to the defense is when, is when you acquire something new that can put you at a competitive advantage to a competitor or take additional market share from that competitor. So whether that's consolidation of an industry, you get more scale with that, you get an ability to see more customers and potentially revenue synergies with that. So think about this as United Technologies, which was just announced, purchasing Rockwell Collins. So now all of a sudden United Technologies can provide more services and, and business to their existing clients as well as reach new customers. An expansive acquisition is when you go into new markets. So think about Facebook acquiring WhatsApp. So WhatsApp is very global. Facebook really started in the United States, although it's really a global company now. But WhatsApp generates the majority of its users, the vast majority, outside the United States. So now Facebook has this messaging platform outside the US which they can then leverage to generate more revenue and penetrate new markets. And the whole objective of all of this is that the whole ends up being more than the sum of the parts. You don't want to acquire a company that doesn't do any more for you than it did by itself. You want to acquire a company which you can really leverage and leverage your existing products for their customers, leverage their products for your customers, and really grow the combined value of both companies as a result. And this is especially important because generally when you make an acquisition, you acquire a company at a premium to the going rate. Why are you acquiring it at a premium? Because you think you can generate this extra money, which we call synergies. And Sam, you have some data on this. Yeah, Ben, so the, the average premium paid for uh, mergers and acquisitions is about 30%, which does place a huge emphasis on the synergies and uh, companies being able to actually capture those synergies. Um, and a couple uh, notes on synergies. Cost synergies, the empirical evidence is that cost synergies are easier to capture than revenue synergies. And um, this is just from a slide that I had uh, when I was back in school about a year ago. I believe it was from McKinsey Research that uh, in over 60% of M&A, the acquirers are able to realize 90% or more of estimated cost synergies, which is, that's great. However, only 30% of transactions that is the acquirer actually able to realize 90% or more of the estimated revenue synergies. Mm -hmm. So basically, if, the, if it's cost synergies that you're capturing, then there's a good chance that you can bet they're gonna capture those. But if you're thinking about revenue synergies, it looks like you're not gonna be able to get that. Um, so, you know, it makes me think of the Teva, when Teva bought Allergen Generics business. They took a whole, on a whole bunch of debt, you know, because they thought there was a bunch of synergies to capture and then they're not capturing them. I and look at Teva, they've just been in a downward spiral for months now. Um, someone like Facebook, though, acquiring Instagram, 
it, it actually all pieced together really well. You know, the, the integration uh, was pretty easy given that Instagram was almost identical to Facebook, essentially. Um, and so again, going back to that class that I had, uh, according to PwC, this is 2010 data, so it's a little bit da dated, but uh, one of the biggest challenges to realizing synergies is, the, is delays in implementing planned actions, which basically says if, the, if there's going to be integration issues, it's going to be tougher to capture those synergies, it's going to drag out, and so you actually mentioned the Intel and Mobileye acquisition earlier, and one of the things that I will say, I do agree with you that it's a defensive acquisition, one of the things I will say, though, is that Intel has worked with Mobileye for, I believe, uh, either a year or more. They've worked with them for a while, and so ideally you're thinking this integration should be much easier because these are two companies who have worked together closely, and ideally this will just, it'll come together. But then you have other guys, uh, I don't know, maybe you have a good example of two just complete opposite companies who come together and uh, doesn't quite seem to make make sense and they kind of struggle to capture those synergies yeah well you think about last year general electric buying a huge um rig business mm -hmm. oil oil rig business think about how does that actually fit into ge's core business general electric um general electric really almost becoming an oil and gas business mm -hmm. rather than a vendor of high margin electrical equipment and and uh, infrastructure so i think that's that's something there and then also you have even the at&t time warner business um we we're talking to one uh analyst um who covers verizon t-mobile the whole telecom specter sector and what he was saying is that you know everyone's on to this uh combination of the network plus the content, similar to the Comcast. But if you look at what Comcast did with NBC Universal after they acquired it, they didn't really do anything in terms of integrating the two companies and really generating that competitive advantage. They ran NBC Universal very well. They ran NBC Universal far better than G G General Electric did, which by the way was also a business that didn't really fit with GE's core business. Um, but Comcast didn't really say, you know, if you're not a Comcast customer, you can't have access to this content, um, which they, they could have done because they own NBC Universal. So when you look at the Time Warner AT&T combination, you kind of see a little bit of the same thing where there are two companies that don't necessarily mm -hmm. operate in the same space. And then the last thing I, I would have to say, just one more example, um, or I, perhaps two, I'll give you two. Uh, IBM acquiring the Weather Channel is kind of out of left field. Yeah, um, those two don't aren't really don't really fit. And then um, one that really does, and again, this is more defensive acquisition. I'm not saying defensive acquisitions are bad. Um, I'm just saying it doesn't come from a position of strength. Um, Qualcomm's purchase, pending purchase of NXPI, NXP Semiconductors, of course, uh, big chip company. Um, Qualcomm is making that acquisition really as a defensive business and a, a diversification away from its core business. So there are some similarities there. Um, I would say that's more of an expansive mm -hmm. type of acquisition. Yeah, so, and I guess, you know, just to wrap up, that's why when you see these acquisitions come out in the news, you often see the, the acquire share price drop significantly because basically what it looks like is a it looks like a bad purchase at, at first because you're like, well, you just paid 30% more than this company's worth. And you're saying that's because you think that you're going to be able to capture these synergies that make it worth paying 30% more. And so, and then there's all this, you know, the speculation, the evidence or whatever, say chances are you're not capturing those revenue synergies. You have a better shot at capturing the cost synergies. But altogether, if you just, if you said that this company is worth 30% more for the synergies, you're not capturing all the synergies. So it wasn't worth it. But then if you get bought, obviously somebody just paid you, bought you out for 30% more than you were worth. And so that's great for you and your share price jumps way up. Um, you have anything else? That's it. That's it. Thanks for joining us. Hey everybody, welcome back to Tanked. Today we're talking about the iPhone 8 and what news we can expect next week when it launches. Apple, of course, having its normal fall launch announcement where they bring out the iPhone. They may have a new iPad. We don't know about that yet. So 
The first is the 5.1 inch OLED screen, and this is gonna be an edge to edge. Mm -hmm. That's kind of edgy. It's not a new thing though. It's not a new thing, but do you think this drives sales? Uh, do I think it should drive sales? No, but it probably will drive sales. <laughs> <laughs> but what happens to the home button then? I mean, I don't know about you, but when I, when I pick up my iPhone, cause I have iPhone 6S, when I pick it up, I, I really press the home button just cause like mm -hmm. it recognizes when you touch it. And same with their, their facial recognition, which I'm sure you're going to get to, like, they're going to recognize like when you're looking at your phone. Right. It's so, like the, the use of the home button is going to decline pretty markedly anyways. And that was my question. You know, I think that Apple has done some new innovations over the past couple of years. Last year, of course, they did away with the headphone jack and just said, you know, we'll just play the music through the, uh, the power cord. But a lot of people had frustrations with that because they, of course, have that auxiliary jack in their vehicles. Mm -hmm. And so they now can't play their music and charge at the same time. Um, are they doing the same thing with the facial recognition? Is this going to be something that people are upset with or are they going to be happy with it? Um, the way they were when they actually changed the power cord itself. I would guess that's something that people are initially going to be like, Oh, I don't like this, but then it's just something that they accept as an Apple user. Just yeah. cause like they're so like intertwined in the Apple interface or, um, ecosystem, I should say mm -hmm. like just, it's going to be one of those things that they just initially they're upset about, but they just accept it. I'm guessing. Right. The big thing, the big hurdle for me is how do you get people to pay more money for this iPhone, which has really less on it? Mm -hmm. Um, you don't have the home button. You have facial recognition, which probably will be spotty early on unless they've really bug tested it. This is a lot. I mean, I, don't, I just don't know how that works. Um, well, one I, other thing, what were you, when you got into the, um, the the two jack thing right what they what they're trying to do is the wireless charging now which mm -hmm. is i think a, a rumor at this point i don't know how confirmed that is the yeah. wireless charging on this iphone so that makes that that charging and listening to something the audio jack at the same time less of an issue which i'm sure they knew that like years ago like hey we're going this way so let's just wean that out and then Right. You know, I'm getting at. <laughs> yeah, no, I, 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 I under, understand. I just think that it's making people the, the beauty of the iPhone is that people don't really have to think it's so intuitive. Mm -hmm. And so when you change it, it becomes naturally less intuitive. And I think that that allows people to start thinking, hey, no, maybe I should be switching. Maybe I should look at this new Samsung phone, especially when you look at the prices. I mean, we, we haven't talked about the price yet, but the, the, the basic iPhone eight is going to be a thousand dollars. And then ramp up with a higher memory, you get increments of $100. So the, the highest end, most memory iPhone 8 is going to be $1,200. You could be buying a MacBook for that price. Yeah. And the, like like you said, the, the upgrades aren't substantial. Like, are you willing to go out and pay $1,200 when you already have a, I don't know, most people have six, sixes, let's say, or six S's when I'm, personally, I'm content with my six S. I don't, I'm not jumping in the bit to go below $1,200. Right. And then other comparable I, smartphones are you know, 800 for like high, high end Samsung ones. I think the pixels like 650 or 700. Yeah. I mean, when I think about if I wanted a new iPhone, would I buy this new phone, take a gamble on the facial recognition, rely on the new processor, which is supposed to be faster than ever, which the next one is always faster than ever. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just par for the course, rely on this facial recognition, pay $300 more than I could get probably for a high memory iPhone plus seven because that price is probably going to get declined mm -hmm. um of course the old iphone pluses don't have come in blush gold which is a big marketing <laughs> tactic of this new iphone i'm being hyperbolic of course um but they it is kind of come in blush gold any thoughts on the blushing no i don't i don't have much for you there no 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 <laughs> thoughts no. on the blushing um and then there's some potentially new features as well. So we have a curved screen, we have a fast cable charging, which I'm not sure what that means. Um, you could have a forward front fronting, uh, forward facing FaceTime camera and speaker located above Whoa. the display. Yeah, <laughs> that's, that's radical. Um, 
or you could perhaps have a relocated Touch ID. So perhaps you have Touch ID on the back, which I actually think would be a good idea for them to have. So you're not totally getting away with it, getting away from it. Mm -hmm. If you look at the, when Windows 8 came out, or Windows, Windows 8, I think, um, was the new edition of Windows without the start button. Windows caught a lot of flack for that and ended up having to add the start button, button back in to the operating system because they were getting so much pushback from the consumers. I think that they could have that same problem with the Touch ID just because people are used to it. But even if that, even that's the case, I don't see Apple losing many customers because of that. Kind of like with, I guess you have, it's hard to switch with if you're Microsoft to right. Apple, but same, I guess, concept. I agree. I agree. We only have, full disclosure, we only have one of our 13 employees here who has a non-iPhone. Um, he actually has a S Samsung device. So that is not me. I might switch, though. I'm, I'm considering switching next You're upgrade considering cycle. Switching. Yeah, I'm not, I mean, I'm not paying $1,200 for another what's, iPhone. What's the biggest pr pressure point for you? Is it the features? Is it the processing power? Is it the apps? Is it the price? Price. Price. I think, I think at this point, uh, high-end smartphones are kind of homogenous outside of the pro or the the operating system. I think that just takes some getting used to. I think after a month or two, may maybe a month or two, I'd be, it, I'd be like, all right, this is awesome. Like same same type of deal. Well, there you have it, folks. Watch out for the price on this new iPhone. If it's less than a thousand dollars, I think that's probably an upside surprise, mm -hmm. um, especially if it gets that eight ninety nine mark. That's just psychologically more attractive. Um, so keep an eye out on that. That's coming at you next week. So Apple will be broadcasting it live. So if you want to watch it live or just read the blog afterward. Hey, everybody. Welcome to What the Buck, the segment when we talk about important money-related issues. I'm Andrew Hall. Joining me today, Matt Krebsbach, Sam Frost, and Ben Nye. Guys, let's just jump right into it. James Bond, the entire franchise, on the auction block, so to speak. We've got Amazon, and we have Apple bidding for it. Who's got thoughts on who's getting the rights? I mean, I'll, I'll lead it off and say it seems really odd for Apple to be coming in and taking content rights. So, yeah, I feel my like money would be on Amazon. But this is like playing right into what Apple said they're going to try to do and then trying to launch their own streaming service kind of thing. I think it makes sense for Apple. I actually wasn't shocked at that at all. What do you think, Ben? I think Netflix has a good chance, actually. I know they weren't talked about in the article, but they are willing to spend tons of money on content. And this way they can lock up the James Bond franchise. And so this is the only way you can get it. So Disney made the acquisition of Marvel. And but the thing is, the difference between that and the James Bond franchise is that the James Bond franchise is just not net much revenue because they're the expenses are so high. Although there's a lot of revenue there, they don't make much, much margin. So it's great for your brand, but it's not really good if you actually want to make cash flow. So that fits right into Amazon's hands. That fits right into <laughs> Netflix's hands. <laughs> it, I mean, it seems like it makes much more sense to be viewed as like a bolt on type thing, like a like Disney buying Lucasfilm. Obviously, you can't really compare James Bond to Star Wars, but I mean, I don't know. I don't know how Apple just makes use out of the James Bond yeah. franchise. They're great movies. Like, I might be out of the loop, but like is Skyfall's James Bond dope. even like that relevant? I guess Krebs likes it. Yeah, I love James Bond Yeah, movies. big Bond guy. Yeah. yeah, there you go. Bond cool. week. Cool, Bond week, yeah. <laughs> Check it out. But I mean, it makes sense for like just Netflix to have the, the entire portfolio of Bond movies in there. I mean, I'm sure some yeah. people get Netflix just... Maybe not that many, but it's gonna be weird when Amazon buys them and sells it for free to just emphasize their zero margins. That'll yeah. be like right, right in line, <laughs> right up their alley. Yeah, yeah. Um, it'll be available at Whole, Food, Whole Foods too. Uh, DACA deferred action childhood arrivals. Just looks that up <laughs> now. Know what it means. Uh, getting rolled back. Obviously, a hot button issue as anything is with Trump or and or immigration. Uh, who's got thoughts on this? I mean, it kind of seems like some legislative action that was going to be met with a lot of opposition seems pretty unpopular if you look at Twitter. But you know, what's the, what's the real impact? I think Trump's going hard on an anti-immigration push right now. He just pardoned Sheriff Joe Arpaio, Arpaio when Hurricane Harvey was coming, and now he's using Hurricane Irma as a smoke screen in order to a windscreen even a windscreen to deflect from his rolling back of DACA and now he's saying that well it's Congress's job 
I mean, a lot of like business leaders were pretty upset with it, right? I mean, mm -hmm. I think like Jamie Dimon was one that I'm just off the top of my head that says that you're saying, you know, America was founded on like immigration and stuff like that. Like you can't, it doesn't make sense to like repeal stuff like that. Yeah, Mike many people Bloomberg, are saying we're a country of immigrants. Yeah. Mike Bloomberg came out actually with a Bloomberg View piece in Bloomberg at 4 a.m. today. So he was right on top of this. He says this is business leaders don't like this um, and that we're shipping out some of our really intelligent mm -hmm. people. Um, so I, I, it, I don't think it really makes a material difference to the economy or the stock market, but it is not a good look for Trump. It'll be interesting, though, because he just made a deal with Democrats as well on this debt ceiling deal. So if he's trying to use this as a as a buffer and in order to incur favor of the Democrats or maybe just incurs wrath from both sides. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it kind of seems like one of those topics like 20, 30 years from now, you know, if this were to be upheld and like kind of continue to be the status quo, looking back at, hey, these are pivotal moments in recent history in which, you know, maybe the intelligent workforce in America took a pretty strong shift and a lot of people were prescient enough to say, no, this is not good, but somehow it still happened. I mean, it seems like something that could have a lasting impact, you know, if you, if you buy into what some of those people are saying. Moving on, uh, T-Mobile, hooking people up with free content. Ben, I know you were all over this story. You were getting, it was Dome and Ben up pretty hard today. Uh, talk to us. Well, it's having a real effect in the market. So the story here is that T-Mobile, if you have an unlimited plan, unlimited family plan with two or more users, you now have free Netflix, totally free. If you already have Netflix, T-Mobile is going to pay for it. If you don't have Netflix, T-Mobile will pay for it. And if you want to join T-Mobile, T-Mobile will pay for it. So they are essentially subsidizing your $1,000 a year T-Mobile bill, $1,200 with $120 subscription for Netflix, which it doesn't sound like much, but these margins are a lot smaller than you think. And smaller than you think because the amount of cash flow, the amount of capital expenditures that they have to spend in order to build up a network are enormous. And there's arguments from analysts that we speak to who say they're not profitable as it is on a cash flow basis. So I don't know how doing this makes them any more cash flow, but the market certainly uh, took to it positively. Um, and even more than that, it really brought Verizon and AT&T down today, both down over 1%. And it takes a lot to get Verizon and AT&T to trade down lately. That's, that's tough to do. Sam, you got any thoughts? Yeah, I was going to say, the, the market will figure it out. It's kind of when we talked to that analyst and he was telling us, he ba said basically T-Mobile's net ads were fake news. But yet they've had this huge run up because they're stealing competition from AT&T and Verizon. And people are starting to figure it out. And sure enough, they report earnings. T-Mobile em emphasizes this like weird double counting thing they're doing. AT&T and Verizon have a strong quarter. You know, people finally started to figure it out. It took them a while. And so like this is just another instance in T-Mobile, you know, almost des making a desperate move to try to steal users from other from their competitors but in the end it's like you mentioned earlier Ben it's expensive to build these uh, these networks and stuff and T-Mobile doesn't the rumor or the people say that they don't have the money to compete and invest the way that they need to and eventually what's going to happen is they're going to have to generate the cash flow to continue investing. And if they're just giving Netflix subscriptions away, they're going to have to raise their prices that they've slashed for their, their clients and their customers that have stolen market share from AT&T and Verizon. We have to raise those prices and then it's going to go back to where we were, you know, just a couple of years ago. And that is who has the best service, who has the best product that that's who we're going to stay with. And so it'll be interesting, interesting to see what happens in a couple of years um, when, you know, T-Mobile either does build out a 5G network or they don't. So, Andrew, you're the only one here on a fan plan. Would you consider switching to T-Mobile to get free Netflix? I don't think so. Um, it's honestly, I'm sure it's easier than I think it is, but it's such a hassle to make that change. We actually, so we have AT&T and DirecTV, and we get like a huge discount on DirecTV by right. having an unlimited right. plan with AT&T, and we have an unlimited plan because we were grandfathered in there with AT&T. So, like, we're actually getting pretty good deal all in all so and then you look at the cost of netflix is it worth going to t-mobile <laughs> yeah is it is it really worth that probably not at least for me that's kind of what i was thinking yeah. like how many people would actually s are, yeah. are going to switch because they get free netflix yeah i, I don't think many no
So the most important part of the show right now, college football picks, uh, really strong week from the group. Ben and Sam off to really strong starts, both at four and one. Big. Uh, myself and Krebs both at three and two. Uh, ben and Krebs' teams really screwed me. Those are the ones I missed. Um, that's the best part about doing this. You don't know Northern football. There, there is a wild card game every week, but for the most part, we can like blame each other's <laughs> teams on like really screwing us up. So uh, going ahead, uh, Washington, Ben has been begging to talk about how great their season is. They're off to another hard – tough schedule uh they're playing a team in which there's not a betting line which means they're not in the same division so when you can't play above fbs in football so they're playing down uh ben talk to us about washington i think washington is going to win this week um <laughs> i think they're gonna who do they play uh they play montana um from the big sky conference the spread <laughs> is the internal spread here that we have the internal spread is 35 and a half points which is too small i'm taking the over there you go. Garrett, Garrett took the under. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So the games we are actually looking at this week, uh, Wisconsin minus 32 against FAU. Krebs, talk to us. Yes. I mean, if you recall last week, I figured that Wisconsin would start slow, and they did, open, starting the game down 0-10, to 10, but then they ended up winning the game 59-10. to 10. So I think they're going to keep that uh, rate going. I think they're going to cover that one at 32 I can't. Bet. I, don't think, I don't think Lane Kiffin's that good. I he's, can't he's bet overrated. against Lane. I'm taking Lane, so I've got FAU. 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 I, FAU. Woo! FAU lost by like 40 last week. Navy's a good team. Yeah, it's a Navy. Navy's good. <laughs> Not as good as Wisconsin. Probably better than Wisconsin. I think a lot of people would say. Uh, <laughs> That's some alpha there for me. Sam, though. talk to us about Bama, 43 and a half point favorite against Fresno State, coming off of a really big win. Right, big win. But Alabama did not play well against Florida State. Uh, again, most of their offense came from their defense and special teams um, and, and not necessarily defensive touchdowns but you know I don't know they blocked a punt or something you get the ball down close to the, uh, the end zone um, I don't know and they tend to I feel like every year they play a big opening game they come out they win they don't play well and then the next week it's like whew, like we can exhale we can relax a little bit and then they kind of get punched in the face real quick by one of these teams that they should just crush so I'm, I'm gonna take uh, Fresno State there we go Georgia four and a half point underdog going to Notre Dame uh Man, this is like an ultimate don't bet on this game thing. I don't think we have any idea what to expect out of either of these quarterbacks. It's Notre Dame's quarterback's second start. His first start was against a really crappy team. Georgia's quarterback's first career start. So knowing nothing and really, really, really hating Notre Dame, I'm taking Georgia. But And that sounds like a homer pick. I usually actually don't bet on Georgia. But just in this case, I will. So I'm taking Georgia plus four and a half. I got Notre Dame in that one. I think it's going to be a tough road environment. Can't handle with the yeah. New, we'll be new quarterback. I, I think it's like the eighth or ninth biggest stadium Georgia plays at this year. It's almost almost as small as Washington. Not as loud though. I think I'm gonna take Notre Dame as well. I'm taking Uga. Uh, last up, Krebs, talk to us about Ohio State, seven and a half point favorite against Oklahoma. This was your wild card game. Yeah, this one was a tough one to pick. There's a lot of good games this week, so it was either that one or Clemson, Auburn. That was a tough one, or USC, Stanford. That was another good one. Uh, personally, I just wanted to watch this game. I'm, I would have more personally vested in a Big Ten matchup. Uh, I thought Ohio State played a tough game at, at Indiana. I think they're going to come back and I mean, play strong back at the horseshoe. Yeah. I got, even though I'm taking OU on that one, but just because it's seven and a half on the spread, I think that's quite a bit. I got Ohio State. Who's Ohio State playing again? Oklahoma. Oklahoma. What's the spread? Seven and a half. For who? Ohio State. Ohio State. Oklahoma. Ooh, there we go. This segment was tight. I really kept us on shift. <laughs> That's all we got. We'll continue to track these uh, scores, see who's doing well and who's not doing well. I mean, we got to keep it up. We're all above 500, which is tough to do. Y'all have a great weekend. We'll talk to you soon. Tusk Media is a subsidiary of Narwhal Capital Management. Ratings and reviews of Tusk Media content are not to be construed as endorsements of opinions, analysis, or services offered by Tusk or its parent company. The opinions and predictions shared here are our professional beliefs at the time of publication. We are not under duress from any of the corporate entities mentioned. This is not a solicitation to take any particular action. Although we are investment advisors, this information should not be considered investment, legal, or tax advice. We strive to be as impartial, insightful, and accurate as possible. We base our opinions, analysis, and calculations on information we believe to be reliable, but we cannot guarantee its accuracy. We can, however, guarantee that our opinions will sometimes be flat out wrong due to a variety of factors. Employees and clients of Narwhal Capital Management may or may not hold positions in the securities detailed and may or may not hold these positions in the future. A full list of all securities purchased, sold, or held during the 12 months preceding the date of this publication can be provided upon request. Unless otherwise noted, all data accessed via MarketWatch or the Bloomberg Terminal. Past performance does not guarantee future results. A copy of Narwhal's form ADV is available at the SEC's website, www.advisorinfo.sec.gov, or from Narwhal upon written request.